The National Capital Region, which includes the City of Ottawa, remains unceded Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory. We encourage our members and guests to reflect on this, our connected history and ways we can contribute to reconciliation. Next, we would like to extend great thanks to the City of Ottawa, the Province of Ontario, and to our membership. If not for your continuing support, none of what we do would be possible. My name is Ben Weiss, and welcome to our March virtual HSO Speaker Series presentation featuring guest speaker Michael McBain. 2023 marks a landmark anniversary for the Historical Society of Ottawa, the 125th anniversary of our founding in 1898. Doc We've been telling Ottawa's great stories throughout those 125 years, including now through our twice monthly speaker series. As you know, we currently run two separate parallel speaker series. In-person presentations are held at the Ottawa Public Library Auditorium on the second Wednesday of each month. In addition, we bring our virtual presentations into the comfort of your home via Zoom on the last evening of each month, as we are tonight. We have an amazing lineup for, for the next time we gather back at the Ottawa Library Main Branch Auditorium in two weeks. Dr. Jean-Luc Pilon, one of Canada's most respected archaeologists and anthropologists will be joining us to talk about uncovering the clues to our area's ancient past and to help us better appreciate the depth of connection the Anishinaabe Algonquin people have always held for this ancient and unceded land. In addition to Dr. Pilon's presentation, I am delighted to announce that we have invited representatives from Anishinaabe Ajibakan, the Indigenous Archaeological Field School that has come on the scene these last few summers, providing First Nations students from Pekwakanagan and Kitigan Zibi the eye-opening opportunity to dig down into the past, hidden along the shores of the Otto River, and uncover the clues left behind by their own ancestors. We'll hear a bit of their story too. So that's our next in-person speaker series presentation at the Ottawa Public Library Main Branch Auditorium at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, April 12th. Our next Zoom presentation, four weeks from tonight, We'll explore a realm that, like archaeology, is crucial to our understanding of the past. It's not archaeology, it's art. Think about it. When we try to picture early Bytown or the pristine Ottawa River before being disturbed by the initial development, what is our window into the past? Early artists, including Colonel By himself, photographers over the decades like William Topley and Yusuf Karsh have been key to our visualizing and understanding our history. Where would we be without those early sketches and paintings and photographs and the ancient pictographs of the Ottawa Valley's first peoples? And that's only historians' point of view. From the point of view of art for art's sake, Ottawa has been home to immense contributions to the world of art, all the way up to the present and the likes of Annie Patuka. And that's the story Jim Barant will share with us four weeks from tonight, art and artists and their indispensable role in Ottawa's history. Jim was commissioned to put together an illustrated history of Ottawa's art and artists, and it's about 200 pages, and it's an amazing, beautiful collection of art and its stories. Jim teaches at Carleton University, curated some of Canada's greatest works during his many years at the Library and Archives Canada, and is a member of the Bikwanagan. First Nation. Join us at 7 p.m. on April 26th for a breathtaking illustrated tour of Ottawa's surprising artistic past. Which brings us to tonight's presentation with Michael McBain, author of Bytown 1847, Elizabeth Briere and the Irish Family and Refugees. I'm hoping you'll get a taste this evening that will persuade you to go out and get this book. It is an amazing read. A reminder to everyone to kindly keep your settings on mute so as not to interfere with our speaker's presentation and actually turning off your video feed once we get going assists with the overall transmission as well. Tonight's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. So during the presentation, please start typing in your great questions for Michael, type them into the chat box. Michael is a lifelong student of Ottawa Valley Irish history and folklore, and is also author of John Egan, Pine and Politics in the Ottawa Valley, and retired now is former national coordinator of the National Health Coalition. March is Irish Heritage Month and also La Moi de la Francophonie. So how fitting that Michael will now take us back to the early days of Bytown, a Bytown divided and then united by crisis. The plight of typhus stricken famine refugees from Ireland and the order of French Canadian nuns who came to their aid. A reminder once more to everyone to please stay, stay, stay set on mute and please begin to type 
those great questions into the chat box. Over to you now, Michael. Thank you, Ben. It's an honor to speak to the Historical Society of, of Ottawa. And so thank you for the invitation your, and Ben for your support and encouragement. And a special thanks to Jacob for his uh, technical support and to Lynn. I'd like to say a few words about how my book came about uh, and then say a bit about the book itself before we move on hopefully to some general discussion and exchange. As the title suggests, there's really three topics under the cover of this book. By town, so the place, Briere the person, and the Irish famine, which was, a, which was a, an international catastrophe. So really, one way of looking at it is it's the Ottawa chapter of the, of the Great Irish Famine, uh, particularly its worst year, which was called Black 47. And it's also, in a way, it portrays one season in the life of a, of a very interesting person, uh, Elizabeth Briere, and of course, in the life of Bytown, the summer of 1847. What I set out to do in my research was really dig into some primary sources. I wanted to see if there was any eyewitness accounts of, um, of the, the, the events in Bytown in 1847. And uh, the four I list here are the richest sources of, of eyewitness accounts in, in my work. Uh, fortunately, there's fairly rich series of letters, um, some important correspondence between Elizabeth Briere uh, and, and her superior in Montreal. The same with Oblate Father Tellman and his superior in, in uh, Marseille, France. And there was a very important memoir by Father Dandaran, who lived to be 102, and fortunately was interviewed and talked in very moving detail about his memories of what was going on in Bytown in 1847. The, 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 the main primary source that got me started was the Bytown Packet, edited by Henry Friel. The Bytown Packet. Uh, had has some really important coverage of the the Irish famine. Uh, I'll have more to say about the packet. There's other letters too, fortunately, from emigrant agents, um, uh, Agent Hawk, to in particular to the Bytown agent. And uh, finally, another kind of primary source is the legislative debates or the, the debates of legislative assembly because the assembly was located quite close to the labor sheds in Montreal. So there was a number of important politicians who had experience of what was happening in the fever sheds with this crisis in 1847 in Montreal. So we're, we're able to, to witness and understand what was happening. Uh, I don't know if, if, if folks have, have seen the surviving issues of the Bytown Packet for 1847. But when I started my research uh, about seven years ago, I had to go to the National Archives and, and uh, it was on microfiche and the quality was pretty poor. As you can see, the, the bottoms of most pages were, were missing uh, and many issues were missing. It's, I'm happy to report though that now that the Auto Public Library actually has it uh, digitalized, so it's much easier to get it, get access to the Bytown packet. Um, and even though it's it's uh, far from complete uh, in terms of the, 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 the weekly issues that are available, what is available is a real treasure trove. So one of the things it shows you is what was it that citizens of Bytown were reading about the famine? What did they know? And I was very impressed with the extent <laughs> of the reporting of international events in Bytown's weekly. Um, I just want to flag the issue that um, the Ottawa Valley was uh, a very high, it was very much an Irish area, a majority Irish settlement um, long before the famine. Um, there was different waves. The first wave really was the Talbot settlers around 1818, different parts of mostly uh, Carlton County, um, and some went to London. 
and then deep mobilized soldiers from Wellington's armies. In Baitam were the canal workers, thousands of them came um, around 1826, starting then. Uh, and then the, the, I suppose you could say the final major big wave was, was the famine. So it's important to point that out because this, this is kind of a visual illustration of the, uh, the predominance of the Irish in the Ottawa Valley. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the squares with the circles uh, are Irish majority population and the dark shaded squares are French Canadian. So you can see the two dominant, uh, the two dominant groups in the Ottawa Valley, all through the 19th century. Um, you say a quick word too about timber ships and, and Irish ballast. Um, we all know, I think, about the importance of the lumber business in the development of Bytown, because Bytown developed into basically the supply depot, a really important one because of his strategic location on the river. Uh, people would, would come through here to get their supplies and uh, going up to the shanties and then come back uh, on the river rafts. Uh, and uh, of course, these uh, timber ships going to Liverpool, uh, sailing from Quebec City, provided a, a very cheap means of transportation for Irish immigrants. Uh, who, who came back and the empty holes of the ship. Um, we also know that, uh, that Bytown was a, a very rough place, very violent. Um, one person uh, in the mid 19th century described Ottawa as a subarctic lumber village. Uh, this was even after it was named uh, Canada's national capital. So it had a very, uh, very rough reputation and lots of clashes between uh, uh, French Canadian Catholics and Irish Catholics over working in the in the lumber business. And later there was clashes between Catholics and Orangemen. Uh, so there was lots of ethnic tension in the early years of the town. Just very quickly to show, uh, remind people of the two sections of, of Bytown, Upper Town on your on your left and Lower Town on the right. Um, separated by the by the uh, Rideau Canal uh, and Barracks Hill, so it really was distinct geographically, but also uh, in terms of sociologically uh, and ethnically. The Upper Town was more Protestant and um, more businesses, more more wealth. Lower Town was was French Canadian and Irish Catholic, uh, the vast majority, and. Um, probably had more population at that time as well. So this kind of uh, structure or architecture of Bytown uh, kind of sowed the seeds of, of, uh, of, of lots of sectarian uh, clashes. So moving ahead to 1847 and uh, the, the, uh, the, the the Irish potato famine, um, there's, been three schools of interpretation of the famine been identified by uh, historians. The nationalist interpretation, a revisionist interpretation, and, and a post-revisionist. So the nationalist one was tried to portray all the evils that happened on the British government and also claimed that this actually was a form of genocide, this uh, the Irish famine. The revisionist interpretation, which came uh, probably started about the 1930s, and 1940s, um, tended to downplay the role of the, downplay the famine, downplay the impact of mortality, um, minimize the, uh, the significance overall, and, and also uh, was, was very reluctant to name any political responsibilities for these events. Um, they were very scrupulous in avoiding assigning blame. Uh, in the 18, uh, 1980s and 90s, the post-revisionist interpretation came. Um, one of the leading figures was Cormac O'Grada, an economic historian. And it was his 
contention, which is pretty well accepted now, is that all famines are caused by a combination of economic backwardness and human action or inaction. So there is human agency. It's not just an act of God. It's not just an act of nature. Um, to quote the current uh, ambassador to Canada from Ireland, Eamon McKee, it's a governance issue, not a fungus issue. So there is political responsibility for the extent of mortality, extent duration. Slide, there we go. Just a, a quick word about the, uh, the extent of the famine. This is a, a slide that shows the, the dark area on your left shows the hardest hit areas of uh, Ireland uh, during the famine years, um, buff, roughly 1846 to 1852. And these happen to be the areas where Irish Catholics lived, where the poorest people lived, where the most illiterate people lived, where the poorest land was located. So the experience of the famine um, was very, Unequal, unequal. It was uh, depending on where you lived in Ireland, you were going to be affected uh, in different degrees. So, just some very quick statistics uh, about the the famine years forty five to fifty one. Over a million died. A million nine emigrated to North America in these few years. In one year alone, eighteen forty seven, a hundred thousand came to British North America. Uh, over 20,000 died just that season uh, coming to British North America or in British North America. So that was the biggest immigration disaster in the history of Canada. Um, I wanted to say a few words about uh, the uh, the routes that people took to get to, to get here. Um, Surprisingly enough, people came to Ottawa or Bytown directly up the Ottawa River, which makes sense, um, from Montreal. But others were sent on the St. Lawrence on, uh, and uh, came to Kingston. And many of them then came up the Rideau Canal, which was a much easier coming, descending on Bytown by their thousands from two directions. And they were being pulled or, or towed by a, a steamer. And of course, the conditions were a trip. It was, these are trips that could take, uh, you know, up to five days. So there was, there was uh, unnecessary morality. Uh, some cases they were saying that the, the, the it travel in the coffin ships coming across. So um, it's important to realize that when they finally made it to Bytown after the horrible crossing and the experience of gross ill and making it through the fever sheds in Montreal, um, when they came to Bytown, Bytown was in a very serious economic uh, depression at the time. There was no municipal government, no adequate hospitals, no public health of any kind, um, no public services of any kind, and not even a police department. So um, the, the travel conditions on the inland waterways, uh, whether it was the St. Lawrence or the Ottawa River in these barges was atrocious. And that, of course, word got out in the media, in the newspapers of the day about how uh, one editorial talked about shameful cruelty to immigrants. Um, to, quote, to quote John Rost and Saul, this was family compact profiteering at its criminal worst, taking advantage of these desperate refugees. Um, they were getting uh, so much per head by the government, so they were cramming them in in inhuman uh, conditions. Um, this is a, a slide showing roughly what Bytown looked like uh, in 1847. It was drawn in 1845. 
Now on the red arrow, you can see this is above, which is now the bridge at, at Rideau Street. Um, so the arrow is close to where the front of the National Art Center currently is. And that is where I believe the fever sheds were located when um, the, the, the refugees disembarked the barges on the, uh, on the canal. There was uh, four fever sheds located there. So in 1847, in that one summer, um, there were said to be 30,100 uh, immigrants came to Bytown surrounding area. Okay, so th these are just some basic statistics about the Great Irish Famine. Um, over a million died, 1.9 million emigrated to North America. But in 1847 alone, this is called Black 47, the worst year of the famine, 100,000 came to British North America and over 20,000 died uh, that summer coming to Canada. So by far the worst uh, year of immigration to Canada in the history of our country. It's interesting to see that uh, from Montreal, the, the uh, refugees came to Ottawa by, via two different routes. Some came up the Ottawa River uh, and some came down the St. Lawrence and then up the Rideau Canal, which was a much longer journey. It would take close to a week. Uh, and they were coming in barges pulled by steamboats and they were, they were jammed in standing room only. There was no room to sit down jammed in like sardines uh, for journeys that would take from three days to a week. Um, now it was, it was uh, it described at the time as a, in, an, in a Quebec City editorial, shameful cruelty to immigrants. Uh, John Roston Saul wrote not too long ago, but this was family compact profite profiteering at its criminal worst. The operators of these steam, uh, steamboat companies were, were getting paid so much ahead by the government and were just jamming them in um, with no regard to human life and safety. Now, this is a, a, uh, an illustration drawn in 1845 to show you what downtown uh, Bytown looked like. The red arrow shows the location where the migrants disembarked. We, today would be in front close to the National Arts Center. And at the time, there was approximately four fever sheds there. Uh, and they, the refugees would, would disembark at this point. And uh, many of the sick would then be uh, brought to the fever sheds. And uh, Dr. Cortland would then um, send the, the sickest ones on to, to the, um, the temporary hospital. Now, I should say that uh, two years earlier, the Sisters to Charity, uh, the Grey Nuns of Montreal, came to Bytown and established a small hospital, Bytown's um, General Hospital, which uh, was located on St. Patrick Street. So uh, just, just uh, behind the, the current cathedral, these buildings are no longer there. So the letter A shows you the location of the original convent. You can see it was just a small little house. The middle building was a boarding house and run by the sisters. And the, uh, the, the building on the, on the far right was uh, the first general hospital. And when the sisters came, they, they, besides founding the small hospital, they had women volunteers working in the neighborhoods, had a system of home care. They had a food program, seniors care program, and established the first bilingual school in Upper Canada. Now, because of the uh, the typhus that the uh, refugees were bringing with them, which was highly contagious, um, Sister Briere decided that they needed to set up a temporary hospital on a different location from the general hospital and and far from, or removed from the school. Uh, so you can see on the left here, circled in red, is the actual. Uh, artist depiction of the temporary hospital, uh, um, the migrant hospital set up in 1847 um, to deal with the typhus patients coming in from Ireland. Um, now, this is an artist depiction of Elizabeth Bier as a younger uh, woman. Uh, she um, she wrote prior to the to the 
the arrival of the first migrants, they came the first week of June. And at the end of May, she wrote to her superior saying, I fear them because of the contagious disease. However, I will not refuse to treat them, but I would not want to die of this disease. Pray once again for your cowardly daughter. So it gives a, a, little, a little insight into, uh, into what she was facing and, and the dread, but also the planning that was going on before the arrival of the refugees. And then when they did come, um, two sisters were assigned on each shift um, in, in each of the three wards. So the, the hospital had three wards um, and could handle about 60 patients at a time. So there was a French Canadian sister paired with an Irish sister in each of the wards. And in addition, there was two young women also assigned to help. And in the night shifts, they had volunteer young shantymen who helped out overnight. Now, by town at the time was a, an Anglo-Irish ascendancy town, which meant that it was it was run by uh, by basically people of British Protestant background. Um, an example of that is that the, the Board of Health, which was just established that summer had uh, two, only two Catholics out of 18 were on the board um, in spite of the fact that Catholics were the majority in Bytown and, the, and in spite of the fact that um, most of the, the, the problems or the, 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 uh, the illness and the refugees were in Lower Town, most of the Board of Health uh, representatives lived in, in, in Upper Town and lived in uh, Upper Town. So this created uh, serious problems throughout that summer. Um, for one thing, of course, the Board of Health had no healthcare facilities. Um, and it quarreled with the doctors, it accused the priests and nuns of proselytism. And at the end of this terrible uh, summer, it even refused to pay the sisters for their expenses. So this was pretty dysfunctional. Um, but again, it was an example of the sectarian nature of of Bytown. Uh, another excerpt from a letter from Elizabeth Briere back to her, her superior in Montreal. And she wrote in a pretty dramatic fashion saying, I've decided to abandon care of the emigrant hospital if they continue to provoke us. That is to say, these gentlemen, if they're allowed to continue reprimanding us like we are their maids who are not performing their duties. The doctor is satisfied with the care we provide the patients. He tells us we could do no better in terms of treatment and property. So the, the gentleman she's referring to are the three Protestant ministers who resented the fact that this hospital re, was being run by a French Canadian Catholic woman, which was uh, pretty well unheard of in, in Upper Canada at the uh, Upper Canada at the time. Another example, which gives you an insight into the, the eyewitness experience of what it was like dealing with this influx of severely ill um, refugees fighting typhus. It's from uh, Sister St. Joseph to one of her colleagues uh, the next year. As they arrived, she said, we shaved, washed, changed them from head to foot. And after they had a bath and saw themselves in a clean bed, many would tell us, I'm no long, I no longer feel sick, I feel so much better. It's true that they must have been greatly relieved once we'd removed a large plate full of lice from them. Each one was the size of wheat grains and as red as fire. As busy and as tired as we were, at night we reserved a little time for ourselves for delousing, which gave us some pleasure and diversion from the pain we felt during the day, seeing these poor people suffer so much. Now, it was, it was quite challenging when the first typhus patients came because of the fear of contagion. Um, nobody wanted to help out. Nobody wanted to go near and certainly not to touch uh, these patients. So the sisters had to be strong in mind and body, in body to do this work. It included lifting bodies into pine, uh, pine box coffins, loading them onto carts and driving to the graveyard for burial without assistance. 
because the Teamsters feared for themselves and their horses. Sister Elizabeth Breer accompanied her sisters when she could to bury the dead. On July the 13th, she wrote that she went with them to bury nine -year -old, a nine-year-old girl called Anastasia Brennan. We did not remove, we did not risk removing all her worn clothes from Elizabeth's throat. She gave off a foul odor when we tried. And they were anxious to coffin the body and have it taken to church for a funeral before driving to the graveyard. Her body was black as coal. I do not think this will be the last one. Typhus victims whose skin turned black had small bleeding vessels near the surface of the skin. In Irish, this was called Fia Bradov or black fever. That summer, little notice was taken of death in Taunton. A resident observed that it was not unusual to see 15 to 20 Taunton in one morning. Speaking of the graveyard, there was a commemoration service this August, August the 4th, uh, at the site of that graveyard, which is now McDonald Gardens Park. Uh, ben, you were there, and there, there was a, a good crowd. It was hosted by the Irish ambassador to Canada, Eamon McKee. This is a site where over 300 uh, victims of the Irish famine, just from the summer of 1847, were buried. So just some of the numbers that was recorded in the records of the, uh, the Bytown Hospital by the sisters, 531 patients were admitted that summer. 163 died. Uh, estimated overall deaths in Bytown were around 400 that summer. 17 of the 22 sisters caught typhus, but amazingly, none of the sisters died. There was one uh, public official died, uh, the Reverend Dury from the uh, Presbyterian Church succumbed to typhus uh, in his work relieving the, the uh, the typhus patients. Now at the end of the, the season, towards the end of the season, um, the emigrant agent uh, for Upper Canada, Anthony Hawk, uh, was directed by higher ups to close down the Bytown Emigrant Office and the Bytown Board of Health. He also noted in his letter at the time that the services provided by the Sisters of Charity to the Irish emigrants were, quote, unnecessary and extravagant. Um, and this would then lead to an unwillingness to actually pay the bill. I, I, I pulled out a couple of quotes from senior government officials at the time too, so that we could understand the mentality of the decision makers uh, within this imperial governance structure. Here's the quote from the colonial secretary in Downing Street, the Earl Grey, to Lord Elgin, who's the governor general in Montreal. Um, and he, quote, he said, quote, when you have to deal with the Irish, it's far better to do too little than too much, and rather to allow a good deal of suffering to take place. So this explains uh, the mentality of how they approached uh, this humanitarian disaster. Um, it's interesting though that at this time when this attitude was being uh, voiced by senior government officials, the opposition parties in Canadian Parliament, they knew about the scale of the unfolding disaster and they knew about the culpability of the government. Um, and this was true in Montreal with the Canadian Parliament. It was true in Downing Street, or rather, it was true in Westminster with the British Parliament. The opposition parties there were um, severely critical of government in action. Uh, because in 1847, towards the end of that year, the, the government actually closed down the soup kitchens, which uh, led directly to a major spike in, in mortality rates. Um, here's um, an, uh, an example from the period, which I call causal clarity. There were uh, observers at the time who saw uh, government inaction and government uh, failures uh, adding enormously to the to the uh, to the 
dramatic uh, nature of this mortality. Uh, one very powerful letter written by Adam Ferry uh, to Earl Grey. This letter actually was read in the British Parliament. Very powerful letter. Uh, Adam Ferry uh, was a, a Protestant member of the Legislative Council and wrote that future history will reproach the names and memory of those at whose instance the inhuman sacrifice was accomplished. And of course, at the time uh, in the Canadian Parliament and the British Parliament, people were very aware that the people of Ireland had no parliament. It had been dissolved in 1800 and they were being ruled by landlords in Westminster who really were putting uh, economics issues ahead of humanitarian relief. And of course, in contrast to this um, colonial contempt was compassion from Canadians, a lot of Canadians. In this case, it's a story who's led the leadership of Elizabeth Briere and the sisters with a lot of help from uh, a committee of volunteer women, uh, women from all denominations in Bytown, uh, very brave uh, doctors led by a uh, Dr. Cortland, uh, very brave emigrant agent. A whole lot of people were uh, showed great compassion in Bytown. And of course, Briere was writing that they were the only ones daring to touch them, not even the cart driver. So she she wasn't repulsed and she wasn't playing politics. She saw the stranger, as did a lot of her uh, her her her. her uh, fellow residents in Bytown and showed compassion. So just to make a long story short, at the end of the, the season, when the, the, the uh, chief emigrant agent sent a letter saying that they refused to pay the bill because they considered the, the, the invoice too high and that the, the, uh, the sister's hospital had been too extravagant. Um, the Bytown Packet, edited by uh, Henry Friel, published uh, a long letter entitled To the Irishmen of Bytown and the Ottawa. And it pointed out the heroic effort of the Sisters of Charity that saved hundreds of lives and uh, the, the courage they showed in putting their life on the line. And now to be faced with uh, economic ruin after providing in good faith these services having made arrangement with the government. So the editorial concluded by saying, let that insult and those wrongs be felt by every Irishman in the province and let your indignant remonstrances be heard and at the polls, your insults be avenged. So this is dated December 18th, 1847. Now, uh, shortly, uh, th the thing is when this was editorial was written, the, the writs had just been dropped for an election. So three days later, the, uh, an order of council comes to pay the, the Sisters of Charity their full uh, reimbursement. So obviously uh, this had an effect, uh, but I must add that the Tory government was soundly defeated in the election. And significantly, uh, the big issue was the mishandling terrible, horrendous mishandling of this uh, immigration crisis. So it's important to remember 1847, uh, the disaster, but also to put it into context that 1847 was, was uh, an exceptional year, never before and never since where did we have that kind of Irish immigration into, into Canada. Um, should also remember that 20,000 died out of 100,000. So that meant that roughly 80,000 survived and a lot of them went on to be quite successful. And so it's a story of compassion. It's also a story of resilience. Um, I wanted to end with a quote, which I think speaks to the spirit with which uh, we can learn and be inspired from this historical story of Bytown in 1847. And it's from a Lithuanian French philosopher by the name of Emmanuel Levinas. And he wrote, my welcoming of the other is the ultimate fact. 
And in it, the things figure not as what one builds, but as what one gives. So it's the spirit of opening to the stranger that brings out the best and has a long tradition in Canada and in Ottawa. Thank you, and I'd be happy to uh, enter into any discussion or questions. Ben, if you have any questions there. Uh, actually, Michael, thank you. We do have some questions for you. I can start with a couple of them here and okay. urge anyone to add more as they've got some. One of the first questions is, uh, oops, hang on here. Just wanna make sure my, I'm unmuted here. You can hear me, Michael? I can. Okay, that's good, thank you. Uh, how many Irish came to Canada in 1847 is one of the questions. Are there any numbers specific who came to Canada or maybe- 100,000. 100,000 came to Canada. And a lot of those settled in Ottawa. And um, thousands came through by town because by town was in part a transit. It, they, some were in transit. Um, but uh, 3,100 actually settled in by town in area and close to 7,000 settled in the greater Ottawa Valley area. And Just no that area. summer. Uh, another one asks, I don't know if you know about this, but are there any records of the burials at McDonald, at what was McDonald Gardens? You know about that? Very good question. Um, the names of a lot of the, well, as I mentioned, um, the sisters took the bodies to the church, Notre Dame, if they were Catholic, and uh, there were funerals. And the funerals were entered into the funeral registry. So we have the names of those who had a funeral at a Catholic service. There is no uh, burial, or there's no funeral records from the Protestant congregations. Um, so we know some of the names uh, of those that died, but uh, I would say maybe about a third of, of, we know about the names of about a third. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I don't know, I could be wrong on this. Maybe someone else can add to the chat, but I believe some of the records may have gone to Beechwood because I think the bodies that were at McDonald Gardens were, were moved to Beechwood Cemetery. So I don't know, you might be able to find more information there. Uh, uh, actually, these bodies were, it were not moved. What were oh. moved were the ones that had tombstones. Oh, okay. And the Irish famine victims um, would not have had tombstone. They would have had a small wooden marker. And uh, when by the time this graveyard was decommissioned, most of those markers would have disappeared. So there's many, many graves that are still in the park. Okay. Oh, Actually, um, Michael, I was just uh, pulling up my very tattered copy of, 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 of your book, which I've read quite through, quite through. And I found as a bookmarker, I have the invitation to the Irish famine ref, a rem remembrance ceremony last August at McDonald Gardens. And one of the things I remember is that there were several sections at McDonald Gardens where, where different religions were buried. And uh, the more well-to-do with Richard, I think were the ones who benefited from removal to uh, Beechwood. But uh, like Michael says, the Irish, uh, the Irish graves, not so much. And I, I wanna mention again, what a fantastic book it is, Michael. Now you briefly, you flashed it before us your email address and that's still the best way to get a copy of the book, is it? Yes, well, it's also for sale at uh, Perfect Books on Elgin Street and uh, uh, Patrick McGarren on Murray Street. And uh, there's four chapters on the wet, in the west side of the city. Indigo Chapters also has it in those stores. So Carlingwood, Westgate, um, Canada, and Barhaven. That is fantastic that, I mean, there's so often we don't get enough support for local books in the, in the chain bookstore. So it's great to see that, uh, that it's getting some um, visibility there. One other question that came through um, was, and you touched upon it about the fact that many people took the, uh, came through by town to get to the rest of Upper Canada. But what was the status of the St. Lawrence back then? Was the St. Lawrence not as viable a route as the Rideau Canal to get to Upper Canada? Uh, well, it, the, the problem with the, the St. Lawrence route, if your destination was by down, is it took longer. And it's therefore, it, it was more expensive and more dangerous because if you're, if you're standing room only in an open barge uh, in July when it was 90 degrees out and you're standing for several days, 
uh, that that led to more people dying. So um, the Ottawa route was shorter, but they were taking both routes because they were profiteering from jamming the barges from both for both routes, whether it was the best route or not. And it was basically um, poor regulation and poor oversight. But um, what it highlights was the power of chain migration. The fact that there were so many Irish in the Ottawa Valley and so many Irish in Bytown before this was why so many thousands had a destination. We're going to Bytown because we have relatives in the, in the vicinity or in the town. And uh, that's, why, that's why the disaster was not worse than it was because there were so many people helped by family and got settled and uh, became, you know, prosperous farmers up the valley. There's another question that's a bit related, and um, I'm not sure if you have the answer to this or not, but uh, one of our um, attendees uh, is, had an ancestor who, who, who was part of the uh, Princess um, Victoria's 89th Regiment and uh, was settled in Bytown around 1850 and was wondering if that person perhaps was granted some free land. Was there free land being given out for settlement for the Irish? Um, most of the free land had been gone by that time. It, uh, the free land came a little earlier. Um, but uh, you could get some land at a fairly affordable price, but it was marginal land in terms of the soil quality. So a lot of the potato Irish settlers, they were, they were settling in land that are now in the Gatineau Park. So th this, this is the you know, in other words, it's hills and rocks. It's it's total Canadian shield. So they didn't survive more than, they survived less than a generation on that land. Uh, so the, the good land was pretty well gone by that time. We have one person, um, just to look for some clarification. You meant that 100,000, you said 100,000 people came to Canada from Ireland. Uh, you're including the Maritimes in that count or is that just Upper Canada and Lower Canada? Um, 100,000 would include uh, the Maritimes. Okay. But I should stress that most of them, uh, the majority would uh, came through Quebec, through Montreal. Some went through Bytown, some went through Kingston, all along uh, Lake Ontario. And their ultimate destination was the United States. So a lot of them came through Canada, but didn't stay here. You had uh, talked about the Bytown Packet being a great, uh, a great resource. Is that a, can that be accessed online, Michael? Yes. If you go to the uh, Ottawa Public Library, you can get the Ottawa Citizen online. And the early years of the Ottawa Citizen, uh, it was called the Bytown Packet. So in the Ottawa Citizen collection, you can access the historical editions of the Bytown Packet. But I, I warn you, it's not, they're far from complete and some pages are hard to read, but nonetheless, there's, it's a real treasure trove. Another question is, how do we know that the Irish are buried in the town gardens? Well, we know they're buried there because that was the graveyard opened in 1845. Uh, we have maps uh, from 1857 showing the four graveyards, uh, which was then called Sandy Hill. Um, so there was eight acres divided by the four major denominations. So the first graveyard was, uh, the closest one to, to Lower Town was the Catholic plot of two acres, which is borders on, uh, on uh, Coburg Street. The next one over was the uh, Methodist allotment of two acres. The next two acres was the Presbyterian allotment. And the final allotment and the far end on Wittenberg side was the Anglican Church of Canada. So this is very well documented as the only graveyard in 1847. Um, so yeah, there's no doubt as to where, uh, what graveyard was being used in Bytown at that time. Do you know if these Irish refugees would have spoken English at the time or were they speaking the native Irish Gaelic? Some of the older people uh, may, may have relied on their uh, younger family members to speak the English, but most, most were English speaking. 
um, uh, but some were bilingual. Can you comment on the impact of the 1847 controversies over the famine Irish on the riots of 1849? Uh, the riots in Bytown or Montreal? I guess Montreal. I guess so, yeah. The uh, well, riots a, of 1849, yes, of course, yes. That's an interesting question. Um, it's not directly related. Um, the 1849 riots was, was led by the Orangemen who burnt down the parliament buildings uh, because they, they were protesting the... Um, the rebellion uh, losses bill. The rebellion losses bill, exactly. So the irony is you have loyalists burning down the parliament and stoning the government <laughs> generals. Um, but uh, pretty radical stuff. And of course, we lost our library and archives in that fire in Montreal. Um, and of course, Montreal lost the legislature, never to return, because <laughs> uh, the, the capital was rotating until that fire, and then, then it left, but it was, then it was uh, uh, sent to, to Toronto, and ultimately they settled on Ottawa as the permanent capital. But um, the, uh, yeah, so the, the riots were not related to the Irish immigrants. Um, here's another question for you. It's, it's a deep question for you. Out of the three interpretations about the potato famine, nationalist, revisionist, and post-revisionist, which one is thought to be the most accurate? Is there a possibility of another interpretation emerging? That's a very good question. I, I would never say no, because interpretation is an evolving thing. History you know, the wonderful thing about history is it never stops changing its meaning. So I, so I would say, sure, there's probably going to be uh, developments in the interpretation. Uh, but um, you could probably tell I'm in the third camp, post-revisionist, where I'm not above um, looking for uh, political responsibility where, where it's warranted. Um, I don't believe the, the uh, I don't believe you know, pointing to uh, Providence as some contemporaries did. And, and so I don't whitewash government, although I don't, uh, I don't claim it was a genocide. Um, as you know, Alistair Sweeney came out with his book about Thomas Mackay around the same time you did last year. And, and the three of us actually had breakfast in the fall and, and, and yeah. talked about some of the overlaps. Did you find that you came across uh, various information about Thomas Mackay when you were researching Bytown? You know, I didn't. No, I uh, mm -hmm. I was quite I was very focused on my sources. Yeah. I worked in the Sisters of Charity archives and uh, uh, the newspaper archives and the Oblate archives. So no, I it didn't overlap. Although I found his book fascinating, particularly the uh, the material related to the building of the canal. You know, we were we've been so fortunate to have some great books about Ottawa history come out this past year, and I and I certainly thank you for your contribution to that. Uh, similarly, any information about uh, uh, Darcy McGee? Uh, I mean, he came a bit later. He wouldn't have overlapped with the history you were I, investing. I did find some material on McGee, um, and I think this is something of interest to Ottawa people: is that McGee used to come to Ottawa to lecture on Irish history from the United States. So before he before he moved to Canada from the United States, Ottawa would Ottawa and other Canadian cities would invite him up um, for his lectures on Irish history, and Henry Friel hosted him and introduced him uh, in the Ottawa meeting in eighteen. Oh, well, I guess it was mid eighteen fifties, uh, and in fact, McGee had planned to move to Ottawa. He liked it so much, but. He got a better economic offer from uh, a group in Montreal who offered him an editorial, the editor of a newspaper with an endowment. So it was hard to resist. So I thought that was an interesting anecdote. That is interesting. And I think he went back to Ireland for a little while during that period of time as well. I didn't, I didn't know he'd been in Ottawa. Uh, you'd mentioned Friel, of course, and again, the Buy, buy Town Packet. Um, so that can be found online also at the Ottawa Archives, as well as the Ottawa Library, I believe. But you can find the Bytown uh, packet. Yeah, well, the packet is on microfiche at the... Um, at the archives. At the archives. 
but yeah. you can get it on uh, at your home computer uh, from the Ottawa Public Library. Yeah. Uh, one of our members, Brian Cook, has some questions for you, and I think I'll ask Brian to unmute himself right now to pose those questions. Are you with us, Brian? I am. Can you hear me? We yes, can, Brian. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, great, great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, very, very interesting perspectives, which I, I hadn't really thought of. Um, first of all, uh, the, um, I, I'm glad you mentioned en passant uh, the role of the Reverend Drury. Uh, the Reverend Drury is actually a real hero in this whole, whole activity um, because uh, he came to Canada and, and, and ministered uh, to, and helped with the, 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 the Irish alongside another uh, priest, a, a Roman Catholic priest. Um, and they, 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 uh, they did a lot of ministry for them and uh, Dury uh, died uh, from ship fever um, as, as a consequence of, um, hang on, I've got to stop my video. Dury died of ship fever as a consequence of caring for them about nine months after arriving in Canada. Um, uh, for those of uh, the, the society who are interested, uh, Dury's grave is actually in Beechwood Cemetery now and, and, and is, um, I believe, uh, well, there's, a, there's good documentation in the Beechwood Cemetery about the Reverend Drury, so I'm glad you mentioned that. That leads me to um, uh, kind of two related questions, I guess. I'll, I'll lump them together, Ben. Um, of course, Ireland wasn't the only place that suffered from the potato famine. Um, the Highlanders of Scotland, 1846, there was a famine there. Um, so uh, my question is, did the, did the Highlanders of Scotland also come through this route and were they cared for at, uh, by, 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 by the, uh, the, the nuns um, or were they sent another route uh, for care in another way, uh, they being uh, Protestant and the nuns being Roman Catholic? Good, good series of questions. Um... You're right that Ireland was not the only place, but but the the mortality in Ireland makes it is unprecedented in history, because of the proportion of death to the population. Uh, there wasn't Scottish amongst the, um, or at least not very many numbers, in 1847. Um, I think it had to do with the devastating crop losses in Ireland and uh, the. Crop losses in the Highlands, it might have been a bit earlier. I don't think 47 was the peak for the uh, Highlands. 1846. Yes. So it was a different year. Um, but for some reason, we didn't get the mass waves of the Highlanders as we did of the Irish. Mm, thank you. And uh, and uh, were people of Protestant, was it was the a distinction made between Protestants and Catholics in the nature of care that was received at, uh, at the fever sheds and by the hospital? No, good question. Uh, the sources at, at the time say there's about 90% Catholic, about 10% Protestant, but it was a general hospital, so it was not based on religious denominations. So uh, people were treated based on their needs, not their religious affiliation. And the um, Chaplains from all the denominations visited patients at the hospital. Although I must say there was charges of proselytism against the nuns um, by the th by three the three Protestant ministers. Yeah. Uh, and the sources I've been able to uncover, it, it appears that there was a, a Protestant patient who asked to become a Catholic. And that triggered oh. the charges of proselytism. Um, which, um, you know, which, which Briere really resented because they, they went out of their way to make it a general hospital for everybody. And they had very strong support from the Protestant community. So it, it, it was, a, it was a, a charge that stung deeply and um, she felt it was quite unfair. But, um, but again, these were very sectarian times on both sides, on all sides. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank you, Brian. Did you have any other questions? 
Oh, one, one other one. Um, I know that they built this the separate little hospital uh, for, for, for the fever victims, patients. But I also understand that roughly where the mint is now and, and where the landing of the, uh, the first lock going up uh, the Rideau, I understand that below there, there was a set of fever sheds uh, and they, they sort of landed in those places and they were, they were triaged there and put into sheds. And those that um, made sense to bring to the hospital, they brought up the escarpment to that particular hospital. Right, yes, and, uh, and the, the key position uh, for a lot of this period was, was Dr. Cort Edward Cortland. Yes. And yeah. he was in communication with, with, with Elizabeth Breer. And he wouldn't send patients unless they had room in the three wards. That's right. So if you were lucky enough to get, in, to get a hospital bed, you, probably, you had a good chance of survival, but that depended on there being a bed for you. Which meant that there was a triage process upon landing. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And so when when the sheds got overflowed, or when the sheds got full, um, there were military tents used on Barracks Hill, so close to what is now uh, Wellington Street, um, at the foot of Parliament Hill. So they 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 had overflowed the the fever sheds, overflowed the hospital, and uh, were also being housed in military tents. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ben. Michael, uh, so we have somebody asking where you got the illustrations of Bytown. Uh, on the cover or in general? In, in your presentation. Oh, uh, well, the early prints of Bytown um, are well-known ones that are housed at the um, Ontario Archives which you can download online. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember the name of the artist. Um, maybe somebody online knows. I'll, I'll go back and find it. But well, while, you're, while you're doing that, I just wanna make another pitch for our next Zoom presentation is about the art and artists of, uh, of Ottawa. And that's at the end of April, because again, uh, so much of what we understand and what we can visualize of, of, of our past is, is thanks to those artists who sketched and painted and took those early photographs. Um, yeah, but, so, I mean, the illustrations are credited in my book. There's a plug. Yeah. Um, yeah. The artist of the evocative ones about the the barges that's an early by town were by Thomas Burroughs. Yeah. Um, and online from the Archives of Ontario. Um, I'm, I'm having trouble finding the questions because we have so many great comments coming through. I'm trying to weed through them to find the actual questions. But another one was, do you know how, what amount was finally paid to the sisters for all of this? Oh, no, that's a good question. I think it was about 925 pounds. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I guess another question that comes to mind is, you know, we looked at this refugee situation in 1847 and how does that reflect on on current refugee situations in the world we know that there's 100 million displaced people in the world right now and, and we see that countries whether it's canada or the states of britain are struggling to 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 find ways and and to, to decide to what degree to to deal with these displaced people what what reflections do you see on today's situation well I mean, extremely pertinent question because um, the refugee crisis is much worse and the migrants are much larger. Um, but I, I guess to me, what the takeaway I get from this story of Baitan in 1847 is, is the, um, you show your humanity about how you treat the stranger. And if you look at current government policy in England, for example, with the conservative government uh, threatening to fly people to Rwanda, it's um, it's basically criminal behavior. It's totally illegal the approach to migrants in England. Um, uh, it remains to be seen whether they would get away with that politically, domestically, let alone in terms of international law. So um, 
I think Canada continues to play a remarkable role in um, meeting humanitarian standards for migrants and uh, refugees. Um, we have a great history, uh, including in Ottawa, the various waves over the course of the history of Ottawa. And these are now people that are, you know, really strong, um, prosperous members of our community. I remember when I was involved in befriending some Syrian refugees through the Catholic Immigration Center. And the, the job was to befriend folks because they had government sponsorship. They didn't need economics. They needed a, a network of friendship. And some of the women that signed up were Vietnamese, second generation, had come, their parents come as, as boat people. And they felt it's time to pay back the new, the next wave of refugees. I thought that was beautiful. That's really, that's really in the DNA of Ottawa. You know, I think it's in the DNA of Canadians. I mean, we we are all refugees ourselves, or descend from refugees of, of some point, and uh, and and it's it's paying it forward, isn't it? Um, it is absolutely helping the folks that are coming along now. Richard, did did we miss any questions tonight? We've had a no, lot. No, we're all caught up. Although I do notice uh, we got one question that seems about uh, connecting the uh, disputes of 1847 with Stony Monday riots, and that's Brian McDougall, who's been one of our past speakers. Brian, if you want to unmute yourself, you can might be able to clarify what you mean about the connection between uh, 1847 and then Stony Monday in 1849, if, if you're still on, Brian. We well, well, while we're waiting for Brian, I just want to uh, mention again that it's a fantastic book and that if anybody, uh, and I think you should get a copy yourself because Mike was only able to touch on some of the great information on here. Again, we've, we've put uh, the email address on, on the chat room uh, link, and it is um, Michael, and McBain, Michael at mcbain.ca, which is really easy to do. And I see, Brian, if you can unmute yourself. Um, Brian McDougall, uh, would you like to, I, I think we addressed a bit of the question before, but maybe you'd like to expand on it. Yes. Yes, thank you. Quite a bit about the sectarian issues. Um, that were evident in 1847. And those issues did not disappear magically when uh, the year ended. They continued and they were evident again in 1849 with the Stony Monday riots. And I was just wondering whether in his research, uh, whether Michael had come across any discussions about the connections between 1847 and 1849. Uh, thanks for your question, Brian. You're right. In terms of the riots in Bytown, uh, very much uh, sectarian, um, very political, of course, reformers versus Tories. Uh, the Tories being the ones wanting to burn down Parliament. Um, but interesting, Henry Friel, the, um, if I remember correctly, he was he was involved as well uh, in in the uh, in the in 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 the, the, the riots. Um, he was, yeah. And um, Lord Elgin was tied up in it and, and was uh, nearly killed in Montreal, a uh, victim of major stoning uh, uh, sabotage. Um, but, uh, and that, so that put off his visit to Bytown. He was afraid to, uh, to expose, he didn't want to take the risk of another, uh, another assault in a riot. So Ottawa actually, the, that delayed the visit of the, the governor general. Ironically, Lord Elgin was a major friend to Canada. He was a friend to responsible government. And so uh, he was supporting the reformers and it was the Tories who were fighting him because um, they were fighting responsible government. So it, it was interesting. You, you needed a program to figure out who was on what side and for what reason. Um, but um, certainly a very colorful period. It, it didn't evolve, uh, it didn't end up to be anywhere near as serious as what happened in Montreal. Uh, it got squelched pretty quick. Yeah, I'd like to thank him very much for a wonderful presentation. I would like again to urge people to go get a copy of his book. You'll learn so much about Bytown 1847 and the history of the city that we live in. Please join us. A month from now, 
when we're going to be having a next Zoom presentation, learning about art and artists. And please join us in a, a couple of weeks at the auditorium of the Auto Public Library, where we're going to have a fantastic presentation with Dr. Jean-Luc Pilon, renowned archaeologist and anthropologist, talking about uh, early, early our pre-settler history, as well as the, the folks from uh, Anishinaabe that you could talk about their amazing uh, architectural field school. Well, I think that'll be a wrap tonight. I want to say thank you again very much to Michael for an amazing presentation, for an amazing book. And thanks to uh, Lynn and Jacob and Richard for helping out tonight. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you very much. Thanks again, folks. Take care.